This is uh, the AI Awakening, Econ 295, CS2, what is it, 323. So I hope you're in the right room. I hope I'm in the right room. My name is uh, Eric Bernjolfsson. I'm the professor for this class. And most importantly, I really see this class as an exercise in co-creation. So I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. Uh, you're going to hear from a lot of amazing speakers. And, and I know a little bit about AI, but I think most of the knowledge is ultimately going to come from you all, from the readings you do, from the work you do on the exercises. So I really hope you'll take the time to, to do the readings every week, come to class prepared, ask smart questions of the speakers, um, work on the assignments and the final projects, and I think you'll have a, have a great experience. So let me, um, let me actually start off with a question for all of you, which is, um, do you have the impression that AI progress, tech progress is going a little faster these days, and is it having a bigger impact on the economy and society? I see, well, how many, how, let's raise hands. How many people get that impression? All right, most of you go. So, so if so, if you raise your hand, why, why do you think that's true? What do you think is going on? Why, why is it possibly picking up? And, and actually, so one thing we'll do in class is everyone say their name when they, uh, when they speak, and we'll eventually get to know most of you. Um, also, we, are, we do have class participations. So that helps as well. So, so what's your name? Yes, I know. Um, so I, I guess just the buzz around large language models. We didn't have public large language models two years ago. We do now. And mm -hmm. it seems so you like said the buzz around it? So there's well, a lot of hype out there. There's evidence. You know, that, uh, Pew, there's been some surveys that Pew has done that found that, like, I think 18% of people in the U.S. workforce have, have used ChatGPT at work at least once. Okay. So. Only 18%. Okay. I guess I'm in a little bit of a bubble here. I'm yeah. I remember. <laughs> so <laughs> great. People <laughs> like Tyler, Texas, and, you know, what's uh -huh. outside our bubble. So, yeah. Uh, it's, but then there's all the media hype and all that. But the way you said it, it sort of sounds like it's uh, a phenomenon of people learning about it and there's a buzz about it. Is there more to it than that? Well, there's, I guess, euphoria with, like, media stock. There's mm -hmm. actual, like, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, large, a lot of large tech companies that are actually mm -hmm. pursuing it. Uh, yeah, seems for to sure. be, so, there's a barrier to entry. So that, I, I, we all see that, definitely, I agree. That's a big part of it. But why? Go ahead, yeah, sorry, oh, yeah, no, sorry yeah. I don't know. Your... Oh, this is going to be really easy. <laughs> I would posit two... Big reasons are access to compute and access to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, especially because, especially before the chat GPT era, people were training language models. But the, the, the big problem with this is that like, people weren't sure exactly how good the amount of data and the amount of like compute we're throwing at these models would result, like what, what the result of these like investments would be. Yeah. So I believe it's, the fact that compute is getting better, but there's also this sort of self-fulfilling cycle where people are trying to like starting to realize that, oh, like using more compute and getting these like models to learn from all this like large scale data sets actually, you know, allow us to create useful real world systems. And because of that, there's more investment in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that additional compute um, and more spending on it, better processors, allowing them to train bigger models, and are they any better? I mean, of course, they're, they're definitely better than like eight years ago, so. Than eight um, years ago? Yeah. That, just, that sounds kind of like faint praise to me. Yeah. I mean. How about right behind you there? What do you think? Um. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> a lot harder. Okay, I've got to update my algorithm. Uh, but I guess perhaps going back to your original question was, which was, you know, do you feel like AI is impacting us in the workforce more or mm -hmm. technology yeah. in general than it used to? Well, it's sort of two questions. You know, there's the, is the technology changing? You know, we're perceiving more of it. There's something. And then is it having a bigger impact? So both, but it sounds like maybe you're going for the, the second one. Second question then. I can't say exactly if it has a bigger impact, but I think there is a perception that it has a greater impact. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps in the past, technology has largely been focused on specific verticals or specific industries, mm -hmm. but it feels like AI has the capacity of impacting broadly all mm -hmm. industries. And in that mm -hmm. sense, uh, it's per the perception of its impact feels a lot closer to a larger majority of people. 
Yeah, yeah, and and people at least eighteen percent of people are beginning to play play around with it a bit. Um, yeah, how about here? Um, oh, okay. I would say that more recently, us as consumers have been feeling the impact of AI a lot more. I raised the example of ChatGPT because it's one of the first examples of AI kind of having this interface that you and I can just access for free. Before this, it was locked behind, you know, um, right. and um, who knows where. Yeah, yeah. I'm still curious. I know there's computer science, AI students in here. It, getting to the, the core technology, we've got more compute and it's better than it was eight years ago. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, about what's changing in the technology. Is anybody, do you, you have something to say about that? I was going to talk about the previous comp. I was just going to say, I think the perception. Sorry, really, what's your name? I was going to say the perception that AI is changing uh, the workforce and revolutionizing the economy is far greater than the reality. Estimates say that they're only actually about like three billion dollars in generative AI software revenues mm -hmm. uh, in 2023, and that's not including the benefit. If you take out the benefit that like. You know, Google and Meta got from using AI to improve their algorithms. Mm -hmm. Like, if you ask most people who work in the in the real world, like people's jobs aren't really fundamentally changing. Mm -hmm. So, I think that there's tremendous potential in the future, mm -hmm. but for today, it hasn't really changed. Hasn't really, really moved the productivity numbers or whatever, or the, the way businesses are working. But so, how about my question about the the technology though? Who's who's got a little bit of technology back over here? Yeah. I guess um, there's a slight irony in um, the way in the adoption of um, LLM-based or transform-based large language models and the <laughs> fact that the transformer is an eight-year-old uh, architecture. Oh. But I think AI as a field has been uh, amenable to really fast iterations, um, more so than almost any other other field. Um, and the recent um, I guess um, influx of funding into into the space has unlocked a much broader range of of research of the te of the technology, not only from the capabilities side, but also on uh, the interpretability side, and just uh, more I guess uh, interdisciplinary approaches to this one particular mm -hmm. field. Yeah, great. I think that that makes a lot of sense as well. Any other comments on that? Yeah. Yeah, so there's this very interesting perspective in research. Um, and a lot of people at ML Research um, have heard of it. It's called like Richard Sutton's The Bitter Lesson. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea behind this is that um, a lot of the advances we see today in AI are due to the fact that we're just voting models that can better leverage data and better learn from the big data and better scale with the current compute we have. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe like a lot of the more tangential like algorithmic advances aren't actually you know as useful as people like say. right yeah um, so in terms of technology we have seen like advances in model learning right mixture of experts mm -hmm. right diffusion models mm -hmm. um, to, to cite a few um, so there are, there are methods which are kind of giving us a greater ability to learn from these large data sets um, and and leverage all this compute That's part of the reason why we we are seeing these advances. How many people here have read, read The Bitter Lesson, Richard Sutton's thing? Yeah, okay. I'm going to add it to the, to the read. It's only a couple pages long, a few pages long. It, it's, it's, and I think it should be called The Wonderful Lesson, actually, not The Bitter Lesson. Um, but his point is that, it's maybe bitter for AI researchers, sorry. But um, his point is that AI researchers were coming up with all these new techniques and algorithms and, and ways of trying to capture knowledge and, and teach machines how to do tasks, and it kind of worked. You could teach it, you know, here's how to do uh, play checkers or chess or more advanced things, um, how to understand language, this is a verb, this is a noun. But the bitter lesson is that each time, over, you know, uh, progress ultimately came not so much just from that, but from more data and more compute. And so take the example of language, um, the reason it's gotten so good at language is that we've been able to throw a lot more compute, a lot more power with a lot more words and just the machines have learned. We're gonna show you a little while, I'll explain a little bit more about what machine learning and how that's different. And the machines have learned how to understand it and you don't really need all that syntax and grammar and other stuff that they were trying to teach the machines in, in order to get some pretty decent 
language understanding, and I use the word understanding advisedly. Chris Manning, one of the giants of the field of NLP, whose office is here, um, he said it was okay for me to call it understanding. So I, I'm going to go ahead and go with that. Um, so that's a bitter lesson, maybe in a way, that, that AI researchers were just being overwhelmed by more compute and more data. Maybe it's a good lesson because, you know, that gives us a path. And one of the things that a lot of these companies are doing is investing in that more. Now they understand this lesson. And so that is a path towards better progress. Of course, it's a little bit of an oversimplification. Some of each is important. And if I were really to, to say three things that have driven this revolution, one is more compute. One is a lot more data. Uh, it used to be, um, like, when you guys were little children, um, most of the world did not have a lot of digital data. Photos, um, uh, messages were generally sent in analog form. Now they're pretty much all digitized, and there's vastly more digital data, orders of magnitude more digital data than there was in the 70s or 80s or even the 90s. And that's the lifeblood. So the compute, the data. And the third thing I want to keep on the list is better algorithms, more parameters, more, more um, advances in things like the transformer, which is a big invention. Some people think it may be one of the biggest inventions in history um, that allows us to manage this more effectively. And it took a little while to realize how powerful it was. It was not that, didn't, the paper didn't get that much attention when it was first published by the team at Google, but very quickly people started realizing how powerful it was. So is there a question? Someone had a hand. Okay, yes. Sorry, what's your mine, name? Mine was going to... Wait, wait, sorry. You get sorry. Hi. Um, this was going towards a different part of the question, and yeah. I guess less technical. Yeah. But it was going back towards specifically the word impression and yes. the type of impression. And mm -hmm. I think so much of the impression of AI is that the, the commercialization of these language models, for example, ChatGPT, whether you look at what it is Gemini now, um, has allowed so many other startups and companies to build upon the existing infrastructure and technology, which yeah. is making it accessible and so interdisciplinary, which mm -hmm. is making the buzz experience yeah. um, so much more helpful across. Right, I think so. So we're, we're building on all of that. So there are a number of things that, that are happening here, the, the technology, other people building on it. And I do think that the, the underlying technological innovations are really important, partly because of Richard Sutton's bitter lesson, partly because of genuine improvements in, in algorithms and approaches. Um, and we're just beginning to see some impact in terms of people using it. it um, I've gone to Congress a bunch of times to talk to people about AI. And I can tell you most of the time when I said, oh, I'm an economist, I'm here to talk about technology, their eyes would start glazing over and they would kind of like, you know, politely listen and try and change the subject. But now they're all like hanging on every word. I show up and they've read all my papers in advance in the White House and Congress because they really see that this is beginning to have a big effect. The dollars may not be that big right now in terms of the productivity effect, but everyone's betting that they will be. And I'll show you some reasons why they, they think they're betting that that's a plausible bet to make. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the, the, the impact, the economic changes are lagging way behind the potential of the technology. So one way to think about that is if somehow something terrible happened and all tech progress just froze, all the technologists went on strike or there's a big earthquake or something that stopped tech progress in AI, for the next 5, 10, 20 years, maybe more, we would continue to have progress in business innovation and economic uh, productivity growth as people figured out ways of implementing the stuff that's already been invented and that's available today and this needs to be implemented. Yes, your name? Um, I had, I guess, half question, half comment about like, or your original question was like the risk or like if, you know, the technology is outpacing the economy and society. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about the importance of new data for training these models. But it's mm -hmm. a huge issue with the models that currently exist that we're kind of running out of data and it's being trained mm -hmm. on AI generated data, which yeah. is augmenting hallucinations. Well, that would be a, that would be a really bitter lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, if, if data is what drives it, then we run out of data. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some of my speakers are going to dive into that with more expertise. So it's a really important question because the recent models have been trained on almost all the data on the internet. They've just scraped it all. They've read or uh, been trained on most of the words in books. So where are you going to get the additional data? If you're going to keep having more data, more compute, well, 
you're running into limits. And there's a genuinely open question as to whether or not you can use synthetic data, which seems a little crazy. Like you have a machine generate a sentence and then you train it on that sentence. Like, how could that possibly work? But we'll hear from some speakers who say, yeah, maybe, maybe that is working in some context. And you can see a few places where it clearly does work. Um, how many of you have heard of Alpha Zero? So how was that trained? Who, how, how, not, so <laughs> who else? Yes, yeah, over here. Um, it was trained through like self play, like it, it basically, well, for chess, it played against itself. Yeah, and not just chess, also Go. Go. Yeah, so that was synthetic data. It's the Alpha Alpha Go was trained on human play games. It had all those games that were recorded, what each person moved and said, oh, when, you know, in this board position, this is the move that was made. And it, from that, learned new rules. Alpha Zero was trained on, as its name implies, zero human data. But it knew the rules, so it generated its own games and saw what would happen, and it did that billions or trillions of times. And so when you have a well-defined set of rules, you can generate lots of data and learn from that. And some people try to do that with uh, physics engines, like maybe for robotics or for, um, for driving you know, simulations. Maybe you can generate some data, or maybe you have a video of a professor lecturing to a class, and then like they start getting a sense, um, not from the text or voice data, but maybe from the way People are interacting, you know, that, oh, you dropped this pen. So that says something, maybe you can infer something about gravity from that or other things. And those are also possibilities of generating data that wasn't recorded previously. But it's, it's an open question and, and how much you can do from uh, uh, synthetic data or other kinds. And we'll see. My, my suspicion is that there are certain problems that will be very amenable to it playing games, <laughs> if you have well-defined rules. So other ones where it may be very difficult, and, and they'll be working on that, but that's, that's an open thing. And, and one of the subtexts of your question is that um, a lot of, if you go to the web today, a lot of the content is generated by LLMs. Like, I'm on Twitter, which I probably shouldn't be, but I just got, I just logged in and I saw like a whole bunch of bots are following me and they're responding to me. I can tell that they're bots because they're not that good, but somebody who scrapes Twitter is now going to get a bunch of you know, LLM-generated data and use that to train the next one. And I don't know, that could get dysfunctional. Did you want to say something? I just wanted to say, like, I think yeah. a risk, social economic risk, yeah. that I think we're all very aware of is like we all came into this class with expectations of policy applications or government applications or different companies that we could possibly launch with this technology. But like the bottom line is we don't even know how it's going to malfunction. And that's really scary. Right. Know? There's some known unknowns that like we, we know there's some risks in all those areas and there's some unknown unknowns that like we haven't even imagined yet something unexpected and that's something we want to think about. And uh, after class, I encourage you to stick around. It's optional. But from six to seven, um, we're going to sit in a circle upstairs and um, we'll, every, I want to hear about everybody's like interest, what they're hoping to get out of the class, what, what their AI concerns are, are, concerns about AI and, and their hopes for AI. We don't have time to do that right now during class, but those who want to, we can do that afterwards. That will help for team formation as well. So there's clearly a lot of hype out there, uh, a lot of unfounded claims, um, especially I think it gets, gets worse the further away you, you get from uh, Stanford, um, that there's just people who aren't that familiar with the stuff and are just making stuff up. Um, but it happens around here as well. But there's also unquestionably something fundamental, something real going on with the technology. One of the reasons that I came over from MIT to Stanford about four years ago is I wanted to be a little closer to where a lot of the people who are inventing it. I think we're all very lucky to be here at this place at this time. Um, and so I, I very frequently ask AI researchers, like it's one of the first questions I ask if I talk to a new one, you know, were you surprised? Is, is this unexpected? And almost invariably, they say, Yes, <laughs> I was surprised. They did not expect this improvement. And I'll show you a chart later that sort of summarizes that a bit. But there has been a genuine inflection, sea change in the capabilities. And that, in turn, is going to trigger more and more economic changes over time. But what I, what I see happening is a improving rate of technology, perhaps even exponential in some cases, 
and not much change or improvement in our business institutions, our culture, our economic understanding. And so there's a gap that's growing there. And in that gap is where most, I think, most or many of our challenges and opportunities in the coming decade lie. And part of my mission in life and with the Digital Economy Lab and in this class is to close that gap. I know some people try to close the gap by stopping technology. I'm more focused on speeding up our understanding, and I'm hoping that in this class we can do a little bit of that, because ultimately the changes in society are going to depend on us being able to have that better understanding and understanding how economics has to be updated, how business processes and institutions need to be updated. So, like I said, I think there's no more exciting time to be alive than now and no more exciting place to be than right here. Revealed preference, I came here. Revealed preference, you guys all came here as well. So let me, um, let me go through some of the content I wanted to cover for today's class, and then we're going to go over the, the syllabus and the requirements and, and answer what questions you may have about all of that. So um, try a little uh, game next time you're hanging out with your uh, roommates or meeting some new people or your in-laws or whatever. And uh, what I propose you do is you ask them, look at all of history. What were the most important things that happened in history? Big question. I was just over in England and over there. People, some people think it's kings and queens and empires. Some people think it's plagues and conquests. Um, but when you really think about it, most of those things weren't that important. I mean, how can I say that? Well, I'm an economist. And, and one way to measure it is the living standards of the average person. Most people on Earth, they were living like a little bit above subsistence level. And then a century later, kind of the same. A millennium later, kind of the same. The average life of the average person, despite all these things happening in the history books, didn't really change a whole lot until around 1775, 1776. What, hap what happened there? Well, American Revolution, maybe, I don't know. Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. Some people would say escape the poverty trap. Or how? But how, how, how? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> well, how did they escape it? It's, this is still a highly debated topic in economic growth, but some people like here and others would say that you know, there were certain institutions, British Parliament and so forth, a lot of property rights exist that allowed all this innovation invention in Britain and then those innovations spilled over elsewhere. They spilled over. I have a, I have a, a much more simple answer. The steam engine, new technology. I think all that stuff probably was important. Maybe it helped the discovery of the steam engine. You could say why, why, why. But James Watt in uh, Scotland made a big improvement in the steam engine. Started became started becoming really practically useful, and they started adapting it to apply to a lot of things. And because of some of the institutional changes you mentioned, Jonathan, it sort of uh, rippled, and other inventions came along. But the steam engine essentially ignited the Industrial Revolution. And it allowed us to, instead of having our own muscles or animal muscles, use machines to move things around and to do important physical work. And ever since then, living standards have grown at a compounded exponential rate of about a couple percent per year. So we are, I don't know, 30 or 50 times richer than our ancestors were a couple years ago. The steam engine was the first GPT. Anybody know what I'm referring to when I say GPT? I'm probably going to get it wrong, but yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, exactly. Good. I'm glad that economists still get to use the word GPT for general purpose technology, not generative pre-trained transformer. Um, so a general purpose technology, steam engine was the first, but wasn't the last. There's others like um, electricity, computers. GPTs have these three important characteristics, according to Tim Bresnahan and Manuel Trachenberg. They're pervasive, that is, they affect broad sectors of the economy. They're able to be improved over time. Um, and last but most importantly, they're able to spawn complementary innovations. So they trigger you know, changes in transportation, in 
factory work, and other kinds of work. So these GPTs um, include artificial intelligence. It is a GPT. It, it ticks all of those boxes as well. Yeah, question. One might assume that the internet was a GPT, but I would argue like it didn't create the same J curve of productivity. Mm -hmm. J curve, wow. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't, so to be fair, there's not like a, a, a black and white line between this is a GPT and this isn't. I think there's gradations. And the internet did trigger a bunch of complementary innovations. It did trigger widespread productivity growth, growth in the 90s and early 2000s. And we're still benefiting in some ways, perhaps that aren't measured, but probably not on the scale of electricity or the steam engine. So uh, that, that's probably, I mean, it. it these are quality, are you know, are continuous variables, not not booleans. So, AI is a GPT. In fact, I would argue that, you know, to your point, the GPTs of different magnitudes, and it might arguably be the most general of all general purpose technologies. Because anyone know who this guy is? De Demis. Anyone ever been to King's Cross at his offices? Because he has a little. Uh, Little slogan there for DeepMind. He's the founder of DeepMind or co-founder. Um, our goal is to solve intelligence and then use that to solve all the other problems in the world. So very modest. I'm sure when you guys start businesses, you'll also have modest missions like that one. But um, but uh, you know, there's some truth to it. You know, if you can solve intelligence, whatever that means, um, you're going to be able to address a lot of other problems in the environment, in healthcare poverty, more consumer goods. There's lots of things you can do with more intelligence. So in that sense, it is a very general, general purpose technology. Uh, some people call it the ultimate invention because it invents all the other ones, potentially. Um, and that is what we're working on right now. And there are metrics, I'll show you some data, that we're solving parts of intelligence in a way that we never did before. In fact, here's, here's one set of metrics. You guys all know about ImageNet, Fei Fei Li here in this building, uh, put together a data set of about 14 million images along with her collaborators. Um, and each of them were painstakingly labeled. That's a starfish, that's an antelope, or is it a gazelle? You know, And you had to be careful about labeling them all. And then there were contests starting back in 2010 for machines to try to identify them. And I used to say that machines just aren't very good at image recognition. In my book, Second Machine Age, I gave recognizing a face as something that people could do, but machines couldn't really do very well. Well, that was then. Now we know that they're very good at uh, image recognition and face recognition. In fact, on many metrics, they're better than humans. Humans are better in some, machines are better in others. And there's that, that steep inflection point there around uh, 2012. Anybody know what happened in 2012? Yeah, and were applied to ImageNet. And so Jeff Hinton and his team uh, introduced deep learning techniques, these neural networks with lots of layers, and in some of the future classes we'll read about them. Um, and that turned out to be really effective at doing these tasks. And the next year, everybody, everybody started introducing them. And we started having uh, progress in that. And if you go to the AI index, um, there's a new report coming out in about 10 days. I'm a co-author on that that has hundreds of charts like this showing progress in lots of dimensions. In fact, do I have it on my next one here? Well, let me do this one. Here's one that sort of summarizes some of the things. There are lots and lots of these metrics that are improving. And it's a little, this is not from the, from, uh, uh, the AI index, but you know, depending on the benchmark, you can say humans are able to do a certain level of performance. And last year in this room, in this class, uh, Jack Clark gave a bunch of these charts and said one of the problems they were having is that every time someone made a benchmark, someone else would figure out a way to get a machine to beat that benchmark relatively quickly. So they're trying to come up with some more long lasting and robust benchmarks. Yeah. One quick question on that figure. So I'm assuming the zero percent points are just when the benchmark or data set came Yeah, out. yeah. I, this is a, yeah. Exactly. That doesn't mean zero performance. Like, I think, actually, if you go back, uh, 
this is probably a, a better representation, but they're all normalized to be between those two numbers. Yeah, kind of like a scale. Um, so it's worth kind of categorizing a few different uh, regimes. So for when artificial intelligence was first, the field was first founded back in 1956, a group of people got together at Dartmouth and coined it and um, started working on it. It was mostly focused on symbolic methods. People were working on neural networks, but they were very, very shallow because we didn't have much computation, uh, computational power. Like, it's like a single layer neural network. And uh, when I started working in AI, I taught my first class, not here, but at Harvard Extension School right after I graduated as an undergraduate in 1985. Um, we were building expert systems, rule-based systems, and they were painstakingly hand-coded. So you would talk to an expert, ask them their if-then rules, for diagnosing a fever or figuring out which wine to choose or whatever, you'd write them down and by chaining together a bunch of these if-then rules, you could sometimes get like, pretty good answers on things. But per Richard Sutton's bigger lesson, it didn't really scale very well. And it was filled with errors and it just, it didn't really take off. There was a bit of an AI bubble in the 80s. People were very excited, but it kind of fizzled and turned into an AI winter. But that's where machine learning came in. And as Rich Sutton was saying, um, a new approach, some people call it software 2.0. And the idea behind machine learning is instead of we humans telling the machine what to do, and you guys have all coded at some point, you know that if you write code, you have to know exactly what you want it to do. If you write you know, a word wrong or a comma wrong, the machine isn't gonna do what you want. But with machine learning, you don't need to know exactly how to solve the problem. Instead, what you do is you have a lot of data on inputs, a lot of data on outputs, and the machine learns the relationships between them, the statistical relationships between them. And you can get a lot of effective predictions that way. So what are some examples of machine learning? I showed you a couple, but what are some other examples of machine learning working in different contexts? Yeah. Money laundering from banks. Yeah, money laundering. <laughs> Detecting money laundering or doing the money laundering? Like anti-money laundering. Anti-money laundering, okay. Well, it probably works yeah, both ways, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta be careful. You're you're giving away some information there. <laughs> what, what 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 else? It's yes. Yeah. yeah. That was, that's the current time yeah. Yeah, spent a lot of time, like back in the '90s, trying to recognize, like reading my my handwriting would be really hard for a machine, a lot of humans too, um, because people write the number three or two in different ways. But a neural network could gradually start. Learning. If you tried to write down rules for that, that would be a lot harder. Um, as well. And there are, yeah, go ahead. Credit scoring. Credit scoring, exactly. Yeah, in fact, here, let me give you a whole little list of them here. So um, this is from an earlier paper of mine with Andy McAfee. But the key here is that if you have a lot of digital data on inputs X and a lot of digital data on outputs Y, if you have enough of that, there's a good chance a machine learning system can find the relationships and be able to make other predictions in sample and out of sample. And right now there's kind of a gold rush going on to find more and more of these applications. Every company, I've talked to lots of them, has a team going around trying to figure out where else can we apply machine learning that we're not applying it today? Where do we have data on inputs and data on outputs that we can do this kind of learning? This is a, a one example. This is a robot weed killer, or some people would say, it's a uh, self-guided robot that identifies unwanted species and destroys them with lasers. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's what it does. There's no fertilizer or, or insecticide or pesticide or whatever. Um, it, uh, it just identifies which species shouldn't be there using machine learning, re image recognition, and zaps them with the laser and works automatically. I forget exactly how many hundreds it does per minute, but it's a lot. Um, so that's machine learning, but now we're in a new era that's building on that, and that is the era of generative AI or foundation models, uh, large language models, and it's a little different than, mach than traditional machine learning. With traditional machine learning, you needed to label the data like Feifei and her team did. This is a cat, this is a dog, this is cancer, this is not cancer, um, this is the number three, this is not the number three. But the new generative AI is using unsupervised, or people call it self-supervised learning. And that 
turns out to scale a lot better. So who here is a, has a good explanation of how an LLM works? How does an LLM train? Anybody want to try? Yes. Sorry, your name? It's like, it's like a fill in the blank. You know, it's an auto progressive close pass. Mm -hmm. So you're just trying to predict the next token or word in the yeah. sentence. Jack and Joe went up the hill. Hill. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of silence there after you pause. <laughs> um, just if you do that hundreds of billions of times. And, okay. and how is that any different than the supervised learning systems from earlier? Uh, well, it's unsupervised in the sense that you don't need to have a human annotator. Why not? Whether a dog is in the picture or not. Why not? Why don't you need that? The data is already there. The data is already there. So you take a book and you cover up one word. Like, suppose it was a little nursery rhyme. Jack and Jill went up the, and you cover up the word hill. And then you ask the system, okay, based on these other words, can you predict the covered up word? And the neat thing about it is it's pretty easy to just pick random words and cover them up and see if they can fill it in from the other data. That doesn't require a human to say that's a gazelle, no, that's an antelope, or whatever. You have all this data, trillions of words. Wow, I said earlier that more data lets you do more training. Well, you've just got yourself a huge amount of data that you can do a huge amount of training on. And if you have some architectures like the transformer model, it turns out that this is weirdly, bizarrely <laughs> effective. Not only at predicting the next word, but also Therefore, you can use it to generate text that says, what is the most plausible next word? You know, And you could make a sentence, and you can adjust whether you want to have the most plausible next word, or a somewhat plausible next word, or a somewhat implausible but still possible next word. And you can start generating text. And in order to, when you think about it, to generate that next word or to, and to predict it, you have to kind of, you kind of, I guess you should have to know something about the world or some understanding. You can, it's good to have a little bit of grammar that you know dogs bark, but maybe you, know, you need to know a little bit about mammals and how many legs they have, or maybe a little bit about chemistry, or a little bit about geography. You know, if you drive north <laughs> from San Francisco, where do you get? Um, eventually, you start have to have some kind of parameters that keep track of all this information. And it seems like these billions, hundreds of billions of parameters are storing something about language that helps it predict what that next word is. And you could call that, Chris Manning says you can call that uh, kind of an understanding of what it is. So that turned out to be a really powerful uh, thing. Um, similar techniques can also be used for generating images. You can <coughs> blur out parts of the images, you make them a little fuzzy, and you see if it can fill it in, and then it learns how to complete a horse's ears or eyes from missing parts, and so on. And that's, uh, that's basically what's going on. And a big part of it is that you've got this self-supervised approach. So now we've turbocharged your ability to learn from data, and that's pretty good. And so those of you who ever watched the movie iRobot, you may remember the scene where Will Smith's character asks, can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? So that movie was made uh, about 20 years ago. It was supposed to be set in the far future, like in the 2030s, 2035, I think it was. Um, and the robot said, what? He said, no, I can't do that. You know, can you do it? Um, but clearly, that wasn't something a robot would be able to do in 2035. I think if they made the movie again today, to be realistic, the robot would have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> So in that sense, we're going a little faster than what the science fiction movies predicted, at least on that dimension. Maybe not as fast in terms of humanoid robots, but we'll talk about that in a later class as well. So there's a whole explosion of different companies doing these things. Uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but let's, let's get into what are some of the um, strengths and weaknesses of generative AI? Yeah. There's Sam, uh, Jared again. What does that mean? It means that they need to see many, many examples in order to generalize perfectly. Yeah, so children can learn a language with many fewer words than exactly. is required to learn a language. language. You show a two-year-old a picture of an elephant, then the next day they know more or less what an elephant is. Not so. Yeah. yeah. What else? Uh, yes. Attributing a particular output to a particular uh, 
sample from the training data is very difficult, which means that mm -hmm. compensating people uh, for the data that they contribute is quite difficult. Yeah, that's a big, so now we're going to get into some of the economics of what the New York Times and OpenAI are debating and lots of other people. How do you, how do you, you know, all this data is going to training them, how do you, how do you compensate? That said, there are a bunch of things that they're turning out to be unexpectedly good at. Um, so here's a chart from a paper last year that Eric Horvitz and his team at uh, Microsoft did uh, called uh, Sparks of AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. Um, and um, the blue bars are 3.5, GPT 3.5, and GPT 4 had just come out, so they tested it. And you can see in a lot of things it didn't improve a lot, but in some of them, like the uniform bar exam, it went from about 10% to 90%. What does that mean? Um, compared to a sample of test takers of the bar exam, that's what you have to take to become a lawyer in America, um, 3.5 did better than about 10% of the humans. And GPT-4 did it better than about 90% of the humans. So this ability to predict the next word also turns out to be very good for, for solving some practical tasks. Now, Taking the bar exam is not the same as actually being a lawyer. There are other things involved, so it's not like a one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's a nice kind of concrete metric of that. How much improvement do we expect to have? Well, I've talked to people, and there's, there's some people who are very optimistic. And so let me show you a chart that might be a cause, cause for optimism. Earlier, I mentioned these three categories, compute, data, and uh, parameters or the, the algorithms that are used. And it turns out that there are these scaling laws that have been quite accurate in predicting progress of LLMs. Um, so Dario Modi and others uh, wrote this paper where they charted progress as you increase the amount of computer power and data set size and parameters. And as you can see, there's kind of like a straight line. This is a logarithmic curve. So um, it's a power law that when you increase compute data and parameters in proportion, there's a predictable improvement in the ability to predict the next word. And that ability to predict the next word is correlated with a lot of these other performance metrics. Now, he doesn't know, I don't know, nobody knows for sure what's going to happen as you extend this, but one of the reasons that uh, Microsoft and OpenAI are spending $100 billion. Sounds like a super, uh, super villain uh, comment. <laughs> but uh, to build a really big data set, set uh, center called uh, Stargate is they think that it's probably going to help to have more and more compute applied to that. And maybe they'll find a way to get more data as well. So we're going to find out how much you can keep pushing this. The one thing I would pay attention to, though, um, on the skeptic side is that these numbers in the bottom here, I, when I first saw this chart, I was like, wow, that's like great. We're just going to keep marching down the curve. But these numbers down here are pretty big, or they're pretty big changes. Like That's a hundredfold increase between each of those ticks. So if these models are costing on the order of $500 million, billion, a hundredfold, OK, 100 billion. <laughs> Another hundredfold after that, okay, well, now we're getting a little unrealistic, aren't we? Because the world GDP isn't going to be enough to buy that much compute power if all you do is just throw dollars at it. So maybe they're going to have to come up with some other approaches. Um, that said, um, there have been some predictions. Any of you guys been to the site Metaculus? You guys know this site? So go check it out. It's kind of interesting. It's got all sorts of predictions there. Um, there's a whole cluster of them around artificial intelligence and, and different milestones, like when will AI get the math Olympiad or whatever. So here's one that's kind of relevant to our conversation. When will the first general AI system and then be devised, tested, and uh, released? And um, they have a few pages where they define a general AI system in terms of passing the Turing test, being able to assemble things, doing a bunch of other things. It's a pretty hard definition, actually, if you read it. And the thing that's striking to me was um, two, a couple of years ago, the date was uh, 2057, was the best estimate of these predictors. That was when AI would reach that level. And, and just talking to people, I spoke to, I speak to people all the time about this, that was kind of what the vibe I was getting from people at MIT, from people at Stanford, from people in industry, was just really powerful general AI was like decades 
away. And I, as an economist, I didn't pay that much attention to general AI that could do most of the things that humans could do because I figured, you know, somebody should be worrying about it, but I'm going to worry about things that are happening in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Well, as you can see, the dates got a lot closer over time. It's been coming down. Um, last year was 2040, and a, a month or two ago, it was 2031. Why is it coming in that much? Well, maybe these guys are wrong. Who knows? Uh, this is just predictions. And we're going to find out, I guess. Um, but I think that this progress in LLMs and generative AI, unexpected progress, is making people reevaluate what might be possible. Is, there, is embodiment considered in these forecasts? Is it part of the definition in general? For this particular one, yes. And so I think, let me just see, I think I actually grabbed. So uh, one, of the, one of it is in here somewhere. Robotic, the second bullet point, so it can like assemble things. So you can go there. There's some that are much more focused on it. So it's, this is a pretty ambitious for some level of embodiment. I think most people feel like the embodied part is going to be a lot slower than the cognitive part, but not everyone. And I've, I must have talked to half a dozen companies, founders of humanoid robots. <laughs> Uh, you guys have probably seen you know, Elon and others who are playing around with these things. I'm, I'm a little skeptical it's going to happen anytime soon, but um, it turns out that the LLM technology is not irrelevant. It has some use for robots as well. As you build you know, world models, which is sort of related, you start being able to, uh, to do a little better. So we'll see, but I, I don't want to spend too much time on one particular set of predictions. The other thing I'll note is that as Jan LeCun says, having a, uh, uh, you know, we may not get AGI anytime soon, um, but I would say you still can have significant transformative effect. You could have systems that are very powerful. So I've ha I had dinner with Jan asking him about this quote, and he said he kind of thought LMs were a bit of a dead end, actually. He didn't think the scaling laws would continue. So I said, oh, so we're going to kind of plateau. And he said two interesting things. First, he said, no, there's other technologies that he's working on, other approaches that he thinks will continue that curve, building world models. But secondly, I said, so you think that LLMs aren't going to be that economically valuable? And he said, oh, no, they're going to be worth trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars of impact. That's just not very interesting. He's a scientist. He's like, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting to business people, but not to him. <laughs> As an economist, I was like, okay, trillions of dollars, that's interesting. Um, I'm interested. Um, so it's something else to, to consider that, that the ability of a uh, model to do certain tasks could have big economic value, even if it doesn't necessarily tick the boxes for artificial general intelligence. So there's some good news. There's also some challenges. I do think that these technologies will boost productivity. They'll make the economic pie a lot bigger. But... There's no economic law. There's nothing in any textbook or theory or anything that says everyone has to benefit evenly. That's just not a fact. In fact, there's nothing that says that anyone has to benefit. Everyone has to benefit at all. It's quite possible that some people would stagnate or even be made worse off. And sad to say, that's actually been true for a lot of people over the past decade or two. Living standards for people with high school education or less, average wages have fallen even as the overall productivity have grown in the United States. So you can have things go out of whack. Technical change isn't necessarily something that's completely even that affects everybody. So it's a, it's a challenge to not only have technology that creates prosperity, but shared prosperity. If the technology leads to a few super wealthy people living a few blocks from here, perhaps, um, and the rest of the country or the rest of the world not benefiting, that may not be such a good outcome. Um, and that's, that's a scenario that's possible as well. So this guy, Alan Turing, um, had a approach towards artificial intelligence that really captivated a lot of people. When I first heard his idea of a Turing test, I, was, uh, I thought that was amazing. You guys probably know the Turing test is this idea. Can you make a machine that is indistinguishable from a human, that if you ask them both questions behind a curtain. You can't tell which one is the human and which one is the machine. And more broadly, the idea 
that AI means replicating humans as closely as possible. When I first heard about that, I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I like that. That's a good definition. Now I think it's a really dumb definition. <laughs> I don't think it's a good measure of intelligence. It's a little bit to me like if a magician can levitate a woman in front of all of us, and we're like, wow, that's amazing. Does that mean that gravity has been solved, that he's developed anti-gravity? We may... It may look like that, but it's really not a very good test. It just, the Turing test is kind of how well, how gullible are we in being able to understand it? And so I think you need other tests that are a little bit better. But more fundamentally, as an economist, setting aside whether it's a good test of intelligence, I think it's a really bad goal. It's a goal that points a lot of research in the wrong direction. To be more precise, you can develop technologies that are substitutes or technologies that are complements. A substitute does the same thing. Uh, two things are substitutes if they, if they can be, re one can replace the other. And the more of substitute A you have, the lower the value, the lower the price of object B. So if machines substitute for human labor, they drive down human labor. But you can also have complements. A complement is something that makes the other thing more valuable. My left shoe is a complement for my right shoe. Software is a complement for hardware. Um, a bottle cap is a complement for the bottle. Complements make the other object more valuable. For some reason, most of us, even me sometimes, think of technology primarily as substitutes. We think, how can this technology be used to do what a human is doing, like Alan Turing? The reality is that through most of history, most technologies have been complements. Most technologies have not driven down the value of human labor. They've increased it. Remember I said earlier, that the value, that human labor is like 50 times more valuable today than it was a couple hundred years ago. What you pay for an hour of labor is more now than in the past. Why would you pay more for labor now when you have all these machines? Well, because you have all these machines. A person with a bulldozer is able to do more work. A person with a computer is able to do, create more value. The machines are amplifying what humans can do. So, through most of history, machines have mostly been complements, have mostly amplified human labor. And looking forward, that's what we'd like to see machines do, at least for a while, is amplify and complement human labor. Um, so let me skip. Well, I'll just briefly mention this. So this is Niels Nielsen, who is a professor here at Stanford. And his vision was a lot like Alan Turing's. I'm just putting this up to say that Alan Turing wasn't a lone person. In fact, it was the dominant view that human level intelligence meant going through each of the tasks that humans do and figuring out if a machine could do the same thing, automate them. So that's a vision that I think has energized a lot of technologists, that energized a lot of business executives. But again, I think it's often a misguided one. You can create value that way, but not the main source of value. So human-like AI has been actually something people have been looking for for millennia. Uh, Daedalus was the mythological Greek uh, inventor, engineer. Wow. Um, and according to legend, um, he made robots that could walk around and talk and were indistinguishable from humans. I don't think he really did that. That was just a story. Um, and then there was uh, Carol Chapek, uh, who came up, coined the term robot, uh, a Czech uh, playwright. And uh, this is a, a play that uh, was popular, I guess, about actually almost exactly one century ago. Um, you guys have seen uh, the Boston Dynamics robots and the other ones. And uh, now we're seeing this generative AI do a lot of things that humans can do. But let's just do a little bit of a thought experiment. Suppose you all go all the way back to Daedalus. And he actually had succeeded. But his goal was like Nils Nilsson's, to do all the tasks that humans were doing. But I'm going to stipulate only the tasks that humans were doing, nothing more. Just replicate what humans were doing. Make that list of tasks in the economy. The Greek economy from 2,500 years ago. So what was that economy? Well, you could automate a whole bunch of things. You could make human-like robots to do that. And that meant clay pots all free. You could just like fill this room with clay pots. Tunics, you'd all have these great Greek tunics. Horse-drawn carts, don't worry, break, be repaired, all set. What if you got sick? 
we have robots burning incense for you. So you can see, okay, could be worse, but that's not really like a big boost in living standards, is it? Having like piles of clay pots and tunics and, and incense. Most of our living standards since Daedalus' times have not come from taking labor out. It's come from adding new products, new services, new inventions. So we need to go beyond simply looking at the tasks we're doing today and thinking, how can we get a machine to do them? I'm not saying it's bad to, you know, the good news is those guys would, they wouldn't have to work anymore, you know, so they live a life of leisure, but they're really missing out. You know, they don't have jet planes or iPhones or mRNA vaccines or all the other cool stuff we have today. Most of the stuff is new. Another way of saying it, and this is in my Turing Trap article that you may have read before class, um, which is that productivity is defined as output divided by input. And most economists you know, operationalize that as GDP divided by hours worked. So if labor hours go to zero, mathematically, what happens to productivity? It's a hard math question here. <laughs> Goes to infinity. All right, that's pretty good. It's hard to get a lot better than infinity. So you've got infinite productivity. What happens to income? Well, if income, labor hours are zero, then I don't know, why are you paying any workers? So labor income goes to zero. Maybe that's not so good. There's a lot of production, a lot of wealth, but the laborers aren't getting it. And if labor income goes to zero, what happens to their political power? Well, I'm not a political scientist, but I have a suspicion that it's going to be hard for them to have as much bargaining power when they're really have no, they're inessential to the economy or us to have that. So, so you can see that infinite productivity, it sounds really good and it could be really good. It's, we get leisure, we get lots of benefits, but it's not the be all and end all, even if you turn the dial all the way to infinity. So that's sort of a trap where you get into a world where the technology is concentrating wealth and power and it's not distributing it as much. Now I wanna stress that there's still lots of benefits, you still get leisure, and maybe you can find a way to maintain uh, widespread distribution. You have to come up with some other way that's not based on labor income. Maybe you can find a way to maintain political power, and that may be a challenge that we have to think about more. But it's a pretty different world than one where humans are necessary to production and therefore have some bargaining power and leverage. And so if we do get to this kind of a world, we need to think a little bit harder about how to work things. <coughs> Um, let me talk a little bit about um, one of my uh, papers where we dove in a little bit more deeply into some of the uses of the technology and how it changed things. So this is the uh, call center that we looked at. And um, in this case, it was started by a group of people here at Stanford, Sebastian Thrun and Zaid Enam, who's a grad student here. And uh, they developed a system that looked at all the call center transcripts and used self-supervised learning systems to identify which ones led to good outcomes and which ones led to bad outcomes. And from that, come up with an LLM that came up with good suggestions. But instead of trying to have a bot that answered all the questions, they had the LLM give suggestions to humans, like this one. And the human operators would talk to the customers. And what we found was, when we looked at the data, there's a didn't have to do any fancy statistics or anything. We very quickly saw a benefit. The blue curve is shifted to the right there. It's about 14% higher. So the people who had access to the technology were able to answer questions about 14% more accurately, faster, solve problems more efficiently. And this happened very quickly. Within about four to five months, the red line there, should have made the colors the same, I just realized. Um, the red line is the people who had access to the technology. And you can see they just very quickly started outperforming the people who didn't have access to the technology or who got it a little bit later. Um, so this is a case where the productivity improvements were quite significant, quite large. Uh, in fact, if you broke it into different groups, the least skilled, least experienced workers had about a 35% productivity improvement. The most skilled workers had close to a 0% improvement. So it was one that kind of combined things. It was basically learning from the, the, the successful call center operators and taking that tacit knowledge and making it available to the less experienced workers. And that's why you got the lift on average, but also a leveling, yeah. So the question I have for that, is that sustainable? 
Because there's a current argument that like you can technically just take all this knowledge, this still back into all of it, and all these people are just after jobs again. Well, so that's a great question, and I happen to have a slide for that. Um, so what we found, and what they found, I should say, is that there are some problems that come up a lot, like how do I change my password? I'm locked out of the system, blah, blah. You wouldn't believe how many times people ask that question. <laughs> I've asked that question. Then there are some questions that were very rarely asked. It only showed up once in the data set. Um, some complicated tax question or something, or something else, that some other question. And this kind of a Pareto curve or power law, we see those a lot these days, um, is not just in call center, but most tasks. Um, which ones do you think the machine learning is better at? Which one? It's a very common problem. It's a very it's common problem. Why? Because the bitter lesson. Um, so you need data to train it. When there's no examples, I think someone over here explained that machines, at least current technology, is not very good at dealing with these one-off cases. Maybe someday. But there's a natural division of labor. And since when a person calls in, you don't know what the question is going to be in advance, arrows paradox, you know, you, you um, have to find that out. And then sometimes it turns out to be that the machine can help them and sometimes it can't. Now, over time, I, one thing that's happening is that this, that line is moving to the right and maybe we'll have more things to solve that. Maybe you can structure your questions in such a way that you figure out which one's more common. So there's things, people are definitely working on that. But in this case, and in my experience, a lot more cases than people realize, you get a situation like this where there's a natural division of labor. There's other reasons why you may want to have a division of labor like that, but this is an important question. Self-driving cars, not happening as fast, because it turns out that these tail cases, these edge cases, are just really hard to learn about, and there are more, there's just a lot of them. But, um, well, actually, let me say a couple more things about the call center paper before I move on. Uh, I want to say two, two, a couple other important things. So it wasn't just more productivity, more performance. We also looked at the customers. They were happier. They had higher customer satisfaction. If you look at net promoter scores, you could do sentiment analysis. What sentiment analysis? We looked at these millions of words, millions of transcripts, and basically we looked at how many happy words there were and how many angry words there were. Um, with the people working with the call center, with the uh, LLM, tended to have better sentiment. They were happier on average. And um, the operators were also happier on average. Um, they were less likely to quit. So all three groups, the stockholders and company, the customers, the, uh, the employees, they all had measurable improvements in performance in this particular case. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. The few years it's been since that studying experiments, like what are like the symptoms of what Johnson? Why are the longer term? Is it the case that like the, this augmentation is the way to go moving forward? Or I think it, it, you know. So let me jump ahead a little bit. So um, I, I have a slide a little bit of future. So let, me, let me let me let me kind of get to that real quickly because I need to go faster anyway. So there's a lot of other research, some of which is in our syllabus about other cases. A lot of them look like what I just described, but the world is changing. Um, I'll just mention that a lot of tasks potentially could be affected. Uh, one of the other readings you're going to look at is this paper, GPTs or GPTs. Daniel Rock, a former grad student of mine and some folks at OpenAI wrote this paper. They looked at 18,000 tasks in the US economy. And uh, for about 80% uh, of the workforce, whoops, let me put that, 80% of the workforce had at least some of their tasks, at least 10% were going to be affected. So it's, it's, a, it's affecting most workers. It, to some extent, especially high-income workers. But to, to your question, I think this is a really interesting topic, and I, I, I hope we can kind of get into it in this class, or maybe some of you in your, in your research. Um, how many of you guys know about the six levels of self-driving? It's on the chart here, so you can look, you can crib. So you could have a car that totally runs itself. You could have one where human and machine work together. At the far right there, level five, the machine does everything. I think those six levels apply not just to self-driving, but to a lot of tasks, maybe most, maybe even all tasks, but most tasks in the economy. Um, I gave a TED talk about uh, AI about a decade ago, and uh, Gary Kasparov, after he was beaten by Deep Blue, the machine was better than Deep Blue, there was this period, which I talked about in my TED talk, 
where humans and machines working together could beat the best chess computer. They called it freestyle chess or advanced chess. And um, um, as he pointed out, even if you didn't have the best computer or the best team, if they knew how to work together, they could beat Deep Blue, they could beat Gary Kasparov. I don't think that's true anymore. So this has progressed through these different levels. And now chess at this point with alpha zero and other like that, humans have little or nothing to add. They're just kind of an annoyance to the machine, okay? Cars aren't there yet. Um, I have a Tesla and I do not trust it, honestly. <laughs> um, I, a couple times it, on University Ave, it almost rammed into somebody. Luckily, uh, I, I, I'm always like on alert to grab it. And they tell you, you have to do that. So it's been harder. This is a picture of me and Andy McAfee. This is 2012. We rode in a self-driving car, a Google car, all the way up Route 101, up to San Francisco and back. True. Um, when it got off the highway to go to do the Cloverleaf, a, a human driver, then it got back on the highway. And at one point, the cars came to a dead stop in front of us, and it stopped. I was like, oh, we're practically there. I mean, you know, of course, it's got to work out a few little things. It took a lot longer. It's taking a lot longer. So I think going through these different levels is a really important question. And here's a, a, a puzzle some of you guys want to work, think about with me, which is when, what kinds of problems can go quickly through those levels and which go slowly? Will we be staying in this middle category for a lot of problems? Um, or will we get to that level for most or all problems? I don't know, but it's, it's an important question. Um, let, me, um, let me skip ahead here because we are just about out of time. I want to spend a little bit of time on the syllabus, et cetera. So, um, and this is a good time if you have questions about the course, you can ask me. So where's my syllabus? Here it is. Um, these are the basics. Uh, you can just go online and read this. I'm not gonna um, go through too much of it, but I will take a minute to talk about the basics here. Let's see, I'll read it with you. So we have readings, typically two to four required readings. I really hope you'll do those readings. That's how you're going to learn. I mean, I'll, I, you can listen to me, but um, hopefully you'll, you'll do the readings. And then, then when you come to class, you're going to be able to get lots more out of the speaker. A lot of the readings are written by the speaker, and you'll be able to ask smart questions. You can submit questions to me via Slido, and then you can upvote the questions. How many people here have worked with Slido before? You guys know Slido? No, not everybody? OK. It's like this automated system. You put, you put the questions in, and then everyone else gets to vote. Oh, that's a really good question. And then I can look at them and using my human judgment decide whether I want to ask the most popular question or the second most popular or, or none of them at all. But most of the time I, I give due weight to my students. Um, and you're also going to um, be, have a chance to just raise your hand and ask questions. But Slido can kind of aggregate the wisdom of the crowd here a little bit. But that's going to work better if you do the readings carefully. Um, we have a team project. Well, we have weekly assignments. And then we have a team project. Um, at MIT, we had a whole semester. You guys only have a quarter, so it's a little faster. You guys are going to have to uh, form teams by April 12th. If you're going to be successful at doing that, I encourage you to come after class today and get to hear from the other students in this class so you know who you want to be teammates with. Uh, after class next week, we're going to have a time for team formation where you get together. There's a Google Doc where you can put down your topics. At least half of you have already done that last time I checked, things that you're interested in. And then we have a couple of progress reports along the way um, in the two different things. So, and then uh, we have a couple of sessions at the end of class um, on May, where is it? Does it say? There it is. Uh, June 5th is due, where is it? All right, June 4th and June 7th. So June 4th, uh, we'll have the policy proposals or the uh, research proposals. June 7th, we'll have the business plans. So plan on coming, uh, June 7th is, is not a Tuesday, if you check it out, it's actually a Friday. So plan on coming to class then between 7 and 10 p.m. and uh, learning a little bit more. There's the grading, nice and neat, 20% in each of those different categories. Um, and here's the amazing lineup of speakers. This class could only be taught one place on earth, and that's here at Stanford, and perhaps only this year, 2024. So we're gonna hear from some really great people and I hope you get the most out of it by asking them questions. I've saved a couple of minutes for your questions about the course or anything else. 
What else do you have questions about? Yes. One course question. What's the minimum number of members on a team? And minimum is one. <laughs> we, in a couple of years, it may be zero. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, it's one. Okay. So yeah. you can work alone. You can work alone. And I think particularly for the research proposals, possibly it may work simpler just to work alone. Um, for business plans, maybe you want to have a team. Uh, the teams need to be diverse on every dimension that I can think of. So have people from different programs. This, when we pick people for this course, you guys know you're a very elite group because hundreds of people applied for this class. And uh, the TAs and I, we went through, and we got a diverse group to come to class, people from different programs, computer science, economics, business, engineering, a lot of different programs. Almost all of you are grad students. There are a few incredibly smart undergraduates in here. Um, and there are you know, diversity on lots of dimensions, you'll see. The teams I want to be diverse as well. Don't have everybody from the same program. That's not going to work. Um, so try to find somebody where you learn something. Having a diverse class makes it a little bit harder to teach and a little bit more, you know, people have different backgrounds. But net-net, I think it's a good experience. It's something you can do at Stanford is get people from these different programs. So I hope you get something out of it. You get the most out of it from, from the team that way. Um, and if you're very neurodiverse yourself, then you can be all by yourself and still have a diverse team. <laughs> yes? Um, optional like discussion sections be So in the syllabus, we have a topic for every single discussion session. Our brilliant TAs are going to run some of them. We have other people who have volunteered to come into class to, to talk about them. They're completely optional, but if you want, you can get more of them. The, the, the one tonight, I'm just going to join you, and we're going to go around the room and introduce each other. The one next week also is you're going to be meeting each other for teams. Future ones have uh, a topic like how to write a business plan, uh, how, to, how to think about government policy, uh, topics like that. And so we have some, some really interesting people coming in for those.